On this episode, we are joined by Sai, a blind person with a rare thing in Bangkok, a seeing eye dog. So if you'd like to learn more about how the blind navigate Bangkok's everyday obstacles, you'll love this episode of the Bangkok Podcast. Sawadee crap! If you can hear this, you're listening to the Bangkok Podcast. My name is Greg Jorgensen, a Canadian who came to Thailand in 2001 and who was the runner-up for Time's 2019 Person of the Year, but was inched out by Greta Thunberg. I voted for you, dude. I just want you to know that. Thanks, man. And I'm Eddie Knuth, an American who came to Thailand on a one-year teaching contract 19 years ago, fell in love with temperatures as low as 68 degrees Fahrenheit and 20 degrees Celsius. <laughs> For at least two weeks, and then I never <laughs> left. Yeah, I guess so. We want to say a quick thank you to one of our patrons, Mike Graff, who supports us at the show shoutout level. Stick around after our very interesting conversation with Sai Techa Wongtam, who is blind, about her experiences in Bangkok, to hear why Mike owes the Bangkok podcast at least a dinner at a very nice restaurant. Yeah, lobster. Yeah, a huge thanks to all of our patrons who support the show. Patrons get a whole bunch of cool stuff, including our regular show, A Day Early, behind-the-scenes photos and videos of our interviews, discounts on swag, which you can find on our website, and various other things that aren't available to regular listeners. But best of all, patrons like Mike also get an unscripted, uncensored bonus episode every week where we riff on current events and random topics. We just finished recording this week's bonus show, and we chatted about the push for a bridge to connect the mainland to Ga Samui, as well as all of the bridges and even a cable car that are planned for Bangkok's Chao Phraya River and how they'll affect each area they are built in. To become a patron, head to bangkokpodcast.com forward slash support. So before we get started, uh, we want to say thank you to everyone who came out to our meetup uh, that we had last week, although at the time this show airs, it's probably going to be two weeks ago, but we had a blast. It was at Smalls again, and uh, thanks to everyone who came out. It was great meeting new friends and old friends, and uh, thanks to everyone who bought me beers and drinks, because I left quite dizzy. Yeah, uh, I had a good time. Thank you for everyone who show, showed up. Uh, special thanks to Tim and Steve. Steve bought me many beers, and I really appreciate it. Uh, so hope to see you guys again at the next meetup. Yeah, it was really cool because because Tony was there from you know the co-founder yeah. of the Bangkok podcast. That's right. Um, and and some some of the people there have been listening since season one in 2010. So it was cool for Damn. them to chat with Tony for a little bit. Damn, old school. That's OG stuff. That's right. And quickly, one more thing too, um, Ed. If you remember last week, we did uh, love, loathe, or live with on decorative braces. And, ah, that's uh, right. Yeah, I remember of, that. A lot of yeah, that a lot of young Thai girls get sometimes. But um, it actually got quite a lot of feedback. I was surprised by the amount of messages we got from it. And especially from um, both Michael and Kim, who wrote to say that basically um, they're, they're a sign of affluence because they're expensive. And if they're unnecessary, <laughs> it's sort of like, yeah, I can get them because why not? I got the money to spare. <laughs> oh, interesting. So it's a sign of wealth. I didn't think about that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, Michael also sent me a link to a Bangkok Post story from 2018, the headline of which is Fad Teeth Braces Banned in Thailand. Oh, um, is so, that, now, is that a national thing? Uh, this is in the Bangkok Post. Yeah, it said one youngster died of heart disease that had been linked to the braces, he claimed, adding that heavy metals constantly seeping out of the braces could also cause liver damage and cancer. Well, that just that just adds to another reason why fake braces make no sense. Yeah, yeah. And I would say if you're going to have an unnecessary accoutrement on your head, uh, go with fake glasses with no lenses and stay away from the fake braces. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or a Groucho Marx mustache, one or the other. <laughs> sure, why not? <laughs> okay, so this episode is another in our series exploring what it's like to live in Bangkok with a disability. And we are very happy to be talking with a woman named Kiran Techawongtam, or Sai, who is blind. Now, you may have seen Sai online a few months back when her Facebook page blew up and she was on a lot of chat shows doing interviews on television and there are a lot of blind people in thailand but the reason that size case gained a lot of interest is because she has a seeing eye dog named luther which is a very rare thing in thailand 
In fact, many Thais don't even know that they are a thing and are unaware that service animals are highly trained assistants to their human counterparts. So as you can imagine, this causes all kinds of issues with everyday tasks in Bangkok like hailing a taxi or going to the mall. So I sat down with Sai to discuss what it's like being blind in Bangkok, how Thailand's views on the disabled are changing, and how exactly she explains to people that her awesome guide dog Luther is probably, in fact, better behaved than a lot of humans. So here is my conversation with Sai. All right. Well, we're super happy to be sitting down with Sai, uh, who you may have seen bouncing around uh, on the social medias and the internets uh, a few weeks back because there was uh, several interviews that she did with Channel News Asia and some others, among things, about um, being a blind person with a guide dog in Bangkok. So, Sai, welcome to the Bangkok podcast. Hi. Thank you. Yeah, it's great to have you on. Now, this this video got a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of attention because mm-hmm. I think that the idea behind the video was that not a lot of Thai people mm-hmm. are familiar with guide dogs, mm-hmm. and you are a Thai who uh, lives in the states, mm-hmm. but you're back for a few months here. So, mm-hmm. um, can you tell us a little bit about what it's like coming back to Thailand with a guide dog, and what people's reaction are to a giant? beautiful black dog who is sitting on my foot named Luther. What, what's that like? Yeah, I mean, it's certainly a big adjustment, you know, not, not, not just about coming back with the guide dog, but even just coming back in general, because it's just a very different living situation. But in terms of with coming back with a guide dog, I already got some experience, actually, because I actually came back over Christmas break in December la- last year. And that was actually the first time that I brought Luther with me. Okay. Um, and initially, I thought that it wouldn't be a problem because I do know that Thailand doesn't have a gu- doesn't have any guide dog or service animals and Thai people don't really know about service dogs. Um, but I thought that, you know, Thai people are generally like very kind. Uh, and so I thought that... The- there shouldn't be a problem. And so there was actually much more problem than I thought, especially in terms of like taking him anywhere in, um, especially inside buildings. So that's still a problem this time when Mm. I come back, but I'm like, I'm more, I'm like bracing for it because I'm like, oh, it's going to be so much problem. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like me when I go into a bank to deal with anything. I have to prepare myself. Oh, this is going to be rough. So so what do you tell people then? I mean, when you walk into a shopping mall with a big dog and they say, oh, no dogs in here. How do you explain that? Uh, yeah, so usually it's my mom because I really don't like confrontation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so usually, and usually, you know, sometimes I also don't know that someone's approaching me. So sometimes she's the one who explains to them. So she'll be like, you know, um, she's a blind person and this is a guide dog that helps her get around. And we do have a law that allows service dogs or guide dogs to go into places. But... From our experience, that usually doesn't work because, you know, they either they don't the security guards, either they don't understand or even if they understand, they still might not like dare to let us in because they might get in trouble. Mm. You know, so, yeah, this is not really the same thing, but it's as close as I can experience. But I I ride my bike in Bangkok sometimes. Mm -hmm. And when I want to ride through a park or something, the Mm -hmm. guy, the guard says, no, 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 no no bikes really and i try to explain I, I, i'm right i'm gonna ride slow i'm not gonna ride on the grass <laughs> i'm not a, a young punk kid who's yeah. looking to do tricks i just want to ride on the pathway from mm-hmm. here to there mm-hmm. no faster than you'll walk and it's just a no 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 because mm-hmm. that's what they've been told and anything yeah. outside of that they're sort of not in a position to make that right. judgment call right but i think for this it might even be more complicated mm-hmm. yeah you know? So I assume then that that you can be much more independent in the United States mm-hmm. with Luther. Is that mm-hmm. correct? Than you can yes. in Thailand, yes. get around on your own and things like that. Yeah, yeah. Just because, because I mean, in the states, I basically live in the dorm by myself or in an apartment uh-huh. by myself. Because sometimes, especially Thai people, you know, they'll be like, "Oh, so your parents go live with you?" I'm like, "No, I live by myself." And <laughs> so sometimes that comes as a surprise for some people. 
Yeah. I, I got that question a lot too. And I, I've been in Thailand 18 years. And when I was teaching high school a long mm -hmm. time ago, mm -hmm. um, that's a question I got. Oh, well, how often you must go back to see your family two or three times a year. And I would say, no, maybe once every two or three years. And I think a lot of, uh, of, of Thai people have a real hard time understanding how you can be so independent away from your family because family is such a mm -hmm. core concept of Thai culture. Yeah. For Farangs, it's different. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I might be presuming something here, but a lot of Thais might be amazed that you're that anyone would live overseas on their own, mm -hmm. and you're also blind as mm -hmm. well. So what's their reaction when? I mean, they must think you're like a superwoman. <laughs> Yeah, and that's actually something that I struggle a lot, almost more than my the issue that I'm facing with guide dogs is just the Thai people attitudes and perceptions really? toward people with disabilities. Because especially when I was in college, you know, like just well in the United States in general, the awareness is higher. It's still a problem, you know, with people with disabilities that people don't know what we can do. Sure. Um, but there's certainly much more awareness and people are, I don't know, I guess, especially because I was in a liberal art college. So, you know, uh, how college students are very like aware about like, say, political correctness. Oh, and, right, stuff. Course, um, yeah. and so sometimes when I'm here, sometimes I got comments that I feel is very like patronizing or hu humiliating, you know, as a blind person, like, for example, one time my mom called one of the mall and asked, you know, updates about like whether I can take Luther with me and the mall representative asked her like, when when she doesn't use her, her guide dog, does she need a wheelchair? And I'm like, I'm blind. I'm not <laughs> amputated you know like and for me that sometimes like if i get that comments from time to time i'm usually okay i'm like i understand that they don't know but like especially now that i'm getting a lot of media attention and getting a lot of get to meet a lot of people i get a lot of that and sometimes that can be kind of offensive for me i guess that people just expect so little of disabled people yeah, and I think that um, we we talked about this with Kun Saba from Accessibility as Freedom, which we had mm -hmm. on a previous show, who's a, a disabled rights activist, and he himself is in a wheelchair. And mm -hmm. and um, he, he, he was saying that for, for a lot of Thai people, if they're disabled or they can't deal with the daily grind of living in Bangkok, they just stay at home and no one sees them and they don't go outside and they're expected to just sit inside all day and not do mm -hmm. anything. But... Mm -hmm. um, we're from Western culture where I'm from. It's at least there's a little bit of more awareness of, of disabled people are just like everyone else. Mm -hmm. They might not be able to do everything the same way, but mm -hmm. they can still be a part of everything else, mm -hmm. you know, the same way. And that's what he's fighting against. Mm -hmm. um, do you see yourself as sort of a, now you're getting this media attention. Do mm -hmm. you see yourself as sort of like, I don't know, a, a, a voice for change? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, I'd, you mean like as an activist or something like that? Yeah, maybe not even activist, but you you can have a you can have an effect, you can have an influence, you can have an impact on the way people see disabled people. I mean, ho I hope so. But even with that, like even you know, with people learning about guide dogs, I realize that you know, like cultural perception or cultural values is just so ingrained. Because you know, even with guide dogs, what I really hope that people would see from from learning that about how I can travel with Luther, what I hope is that they will realize that, you know, like blind people or disabled people can support themselves or they can live independently with the right kind of tools or support. Yeah. Um, but even with that, sometimes I still get the kind of like comments where like, oh, so Luther, help take care of you. You know, like it's still like, a, a a perception whereby the dog, like the disabled person, needs someone to take care of them. In this, in this case, dog is taking care of me. In terms <laughs> of a relationship where it's a more like a teamwork or a partnership where both are equal. You know, people still see it as one is the caretaker and the other is someone who needs to right, be taken care of. Right, like you're totally helpless. Right. right. And I'm like, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I remember you said in the video, a lot of people assume that you can just say to Luther, like, okay, let's uh, go to Central Ramanine. 
right. and he'll go. You know, like that's right. not how it works. Right. Yeah, and and I try to emphasize that. You know, that like I the school the guide dogs who actually have to evaluate me and determine that I am independent before they would actually give me a dog. Mm. You know. Right. So. Yeah. I know you don't live in the city uh, proper. Your house is a little bit outside the city. But mm-hmm. let, let's talk about the realities of, of getting around in, in Bangkok as, mm-hmm. as much as you've experienced it. Can you walk us through, like, what what kinds of things um, are, are the biggest danger or, or barriers to you and Luther when you're getting around Bangkok? <laughs> I mean, I think it's still the sidewalks, you know, like, because sometimes <laughs> I like to joke with my family that, like, you can do everything on the side on the Thai sidewalks except walking (laughs) (laughs) you know like you can find everything on the sidewalks right um so i think that's still certainly the biggest obstacle for me because sometimes like luther is actually very helpful with this kind of situation where you know sometimes the sidewalk are narrows or um there the the ground is not is uneven or something like that he's he's pretty good but it's still a lot of obstacles, and I I I say it often to um, several media that like what Luther is not very good at is like overhead obstacles, mm-hmm. um, and so sometimes you miss that, and and we do have a lot of that. But I mean, just the sidewalk in general is still a very big problem. Right, and what about uh, there's I've I've heard them occasionally in Bangkok, but it's mm-hmm. the beeping for crossing signals. That's not really a thing here when you need to cross the street. Yeah, uh, I actually haven't haven't seen one. I've heard that there are some in Bangkok, but I also heard someone say like, "Well, we have so many intersections, we just haven't." <laughs> yeah, it's like if they have one, it's like an accident. Like, oh, <laughs> this is one in the city. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what about uh, using a cane or anything like that? Is that does that would that help? Uh, maybe not you, but uh, another blind person who might not have access to a dog. Or... Yeah, I mean, I mean, even with now that I have a guide dog, I still use my cane, especially going to a new place because you know both I and Luther would know the area, and so sometimes I'll still use my cane. Right. But I think it just it just makes it, it helps, and it I guess it gets us around, but it's still very inconvenient, you know, because it means that. We just have to be so careful and like it takes us a long time to go anywhere because we have to, you know, look out all the time for like yeah. tables, motorcycles, um, food cards, cards <laughs> joke yeah. vendors, yeah. random people laying on the street. And so right. Look. So, yeah. What about the no, I'm, I'm not sure if you were reading this uh, in, in, the, in the news, but um, the uh, in front of the JW Marriott on Sukhumvit Soy 2. Mm-hmm. Uh, they had a beautiful stretch of very nice, even sidewalk. Mm-hmm. This was f- four four months ago now. Mm-hmm. And uh, the Bangkok, the BMA, the Bangkok Metropolitan Association came along and they said, or administration, they came along and they said, nope, this sidewalk is not the same as other Bangkok <laughs> sidewalks. So they ripped it all up and they put their own sidewalk down, um, which included... Uh, those little yellow bumps. Like yeah, those, like I think it's thing. called walking block. A walking block. Yeah. Is, is that is that is that useful for you? Do you use those, or can you use them in Bangkok? I, I I personally I don't use it because I've been trained from place where they they just don't think that you really need that as long as you have a cane. But I do know that some blind people do use that. Mm. Um, Although that's also another problem because from what I heard sometimes because uh, um, people who like construct those sites, well, they are not blind and sometimes they don't even know what those are for. And so sometimes there will be some blind people who who are following those walking block and it leads them to a tree or (laughs) or some which is, you know, the point of it is to help them avoid the tree. And (laughs) but it's like, you know, the constructors, they don't realize that that's a point. So they just build it a certain way. And that's something that I really want to see change is that I, I, I hope that if the city or whoever or the government is um you know working on like building some certain structures to help disabled people live more independently that they would actually get feedback from those disabled people and not just try to solve the problem for us i guess 
Right, right. And and you can't blame some random construction worker for putting these decoration these nice decorations on the sidewalk because <laughs> I mean he, there's there's no awareness, there's no education right. and that's what I think that we all need to work towards is just making it aware. Mm-hmm. I mean I was I was walking down the street towards Paragon yesterday and I nearly broke my ankle on a piece of sidewalk and you know and I'm perfectly fine and <laughs> capable of getting around. So the old standby is that even fully ambulatory people can yeah. get around uh, yeah. with difficulty sometimes. So, mm-hmm. so it's, it's just sort of a part of a broader education and awareness initiative. So is there anything that people can do to, to, to sort of raise awareness, anything online? Is there any, 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 um, charities or social activities they can take part in that you know of in Bangkok? Um, um, I don't know much actually about, you know, organizations or activities in Bangkok because I've just got back like two months ago. And that's actually one thing that I've been thinking is because I talk a lot about like how I really want to see um, like Thai people perception change about about people with disabilities. But, But what I've been thinking is how can they do that in practice? And and one thing that my mom said, and I think is really a good point, is that Everyone can do something, whether you are like a business owner or a teacher or, you know, whatever job that you have, you can always like think of a way of how you can make things that you do kind of accessible for disabled people. You know, for example, if you have a restaurant, making sure that the entrance is like wide enough and has a lamp, like a slope for you know wheelchair users right. or have like a braille menu or you know like there's always something that you can do to make life just a little bit easier right for people that, that with doesn't affect anyone else like it's right you know. like because sometimes you know i feel like sometimes society was is like you know the government should do something but like there's also something that you as a person can do too yeah and your your Facebook page is great. Um, you post a lot on there with great pictures and videos and commentary. Yeah, it's actually mostly my mom. <laughs> well, she does a great job, um, but it's in Thai and English. And uh-huh. so, like I said, with with Kun Saba and accessibility is freedom. Like I highly recommend people, at, at least you know, give it a like and read through it um, mm-hmm. every once in a while because it really helps you see Bangkok in a in a much different light. Mm-hmm. And it's easy to sort of rush through this noisy, chaotic city without thinking of, of, of everyone who needs to live here. And mm-hmm. It's a really great tool to, to see it like other, people's, other people see it. Yeah. Can you tell us a little bit about Luther? What, what, was, what was, there he is. Oh, he's such a nice, he's a huge <laughs> dog. How does he like Thailand? Um, I mean, I think he's fine. It's, the only thing, it's, it's probably very hot for him, which I feel bad. <laughs> but I think besides that, he's fine. He's I think he's a very laid back dog. So right, right. Yeah, Luther, you're just like me. You're a big sweaty <laughs> Farang. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Is there anything else that you want to want to mention or speak about? I guess not really. It's just like my main message that I emphasize when when I get any interview with the media is that you know because. M- Mostly the media that reach out is because they're like really interested in guide dogs. But I try to use those opportunities to get to talk about like, you know, disabilities in general. Right. And so usually my main message is like two main things is that I feel like the first thing that society, Thai society has to do is to change their perception about people with disabilities from pe- from someone who is dependent and will always need support and care to someone who can live independently with the right support. But then I'm like, that's also only the first step, you know, and then you have to like build some structure or infrastructure or whatever that you need to do to allow them to live independently too. So those are usually the two things that I emphasize a lot. Yeah, and yeah. they seem to be it's fairly straightforward, but it's 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 not as easy as it sounds. Um, yeah, it, it takes it takes work, and and yeah, and sometimes it's just easier to like try to guess what blind people might need, and then just build it without you know asking for their feedback and stuff yeah. like that. Yeah, and I can understand how frustrating it is. Uh, again, talking with Kun Saba 
uh, in the wheelchair. Mm-hmm. And he, he said it's, you know, he's talked softly for so many years. And sometimes you just need to grab people by the by the collars and shout. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's hard because I think it's 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 built into the culture, you know, because we are a collectivistic culture. And so if you stand up and try to like advocate for your individual right, people will look at you and, you know, and they might judge you and feel that you are like selfish or self-centered, you know, wow. because it's supposed to be about like the bigger, bigger group or mm-hmm. society and stuff like that. So that's yeah. hard. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's uh it's an ongoing struggle, but, um but putting yourself out there is, 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 is a great first step and making yourself visible, which is something that you and others do on, on Facebook and social media and things like that. So it's, it's great. But, um, your family seems to be very supportive and helping you along the way as does mm-hmm. Luther. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Luther's such a cool dog. Luther, do you have anything to say? No, he's sleeping, he's <laughs> no sleeping problem. on my feet. All right. Well, Sai, thank you very much. Um, what is the name of your Facebook page uh, for people to check it out? Um, well, the Thai name is Pom Shi Luther, but we are trying to add like the kind of an English addition to the name, which is my name is Luther, but we're still waiting for Facebook approval. Um, but you can also search like at Guide Dog Luther, one, one word. Okay. Yeah. On uh, Facebook, Guide Dog yes. Luther. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Just at Guide Dog Luther. Yeah, guide Dog Luther. There's probably not a lot of luther guide dogs on facebook so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no. well Sai, thank you uh, so much for coming on the show and, and letting us uh talk about it and giving mm-hmm. us some more insight into what it's like uh another facet of living in bangkok that that a lot of people mm-hmm. don't don't understand so mm-hmm. thank you so much for your time uh let's continue uh, raising awareness and improving bangkok for everyone thank you yeah and good luck on your on your school when you go back to the states yeah i hope you live through another cold winter if you're in, <laughs> in through that <laughs> all right thank you so much Thank you. Wow, that was uh, interesting. You know, obviously, it's not easy being blind anywhere, uh, but in a big chaotic city like Bangkok, it's it's got to be it's got to be crazy on a daily basis. I mean, I feel like I feel like it's just crazy, just being sighted. Bangkok is already crazy. Right, right. And that's what I said in the interview, right? I was like, you know, it's hard enough for me to walk down the street. And exactly. sometimes I twist my ankle, but I can't imagine doing it without being able to see. So um, I'm glad that she was able to get a seeing eye dog. Uh, Luther was just seemed like the, the coolest, the coolest dog ever. And patrons, of course, will get photos of, of, of me when I went to see Cy and Luther. Um, he's a gorgeous big black dog. But um, it was really interesting to me how just like people just don't know what a seeing eye dog is. It's something that even though we don't see it all the time in Western countries, everyone knows what it is and what yeah, it means. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I, I would not have guessed that. In general, yeah. I feel like uh, in general, I feel like Thai people are dog people. Like Thai people love dogs. A lot of a lot of my friends who are Thai have dogs. It's not like they're not dog savvy. It's kind of weird that they miss that part of dog culture. <laughs> yeah right right but uh yeah it was really cool sitting down with her and many thanks to Sai and her and her parents who uh let me come out to their house and sit down they're all super nice very cool re- really friendly and, and nice people and thank you again for letting me come out and, and uh and get educated on on this sort of aspect of life in thailand that most people don't know about so again i urge you to go to uh, uh Sai's facebook page and sign up she posts in thai and english and there's some really interesting photos and pictures and thoughts on there about about Bangkok. So thanks again, Sai, and uh, hopefully we will have you back on one day. We can discuss how things are getting better. Okay, so let's get into another round of Token Thai, where our good friend Bowling works with us to get to the bottom of certain quirky elements of Farang and Thai culture that confuse, befuddle, or vex those trying to expand their cultural horizons. As a Thai person, after I wake up, and almost, I think every Thai that I know, after we wake up, we brush our teeth, having breakfast, having coffee or whatsoever. But from my experience living with a Westerner and his family too, like they wake up, they have their breakfast, and then they brush their teeth. How? Or why? Not how, but why? <laughs> like you sleep with your mouth closed or open all night and then you have like you know 
Right. Yeah, okay, I get yeah, it. You know what I mean. My my wife and I have had this discussion, and it, it's it's true. I I brush my teeth after breakfast. What about your son? He brushes his teeth after breakfast. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Ed, what about you? Yeah, same. I think you're right. I think it is a standard Western thing. Uh, you get up and you eat first, and then you brush your teeth. Um, but yeah, I notice Thai people do it the other way. So I, for me, I think it's. You you always brush after you eat to to clean the food off your teeth. So it's like, in, in a way, sometimes sometimes I don't like to brush my teeth before I eat because actually the taste of the toothpaste it it kind of interrupts the taste of the meal. So I don't want to, in a way, like I don't think of my mouth as being that dirty after just lying in bed at night. I don't know. I mean, Greg, what do you think? <laughs> I guess it depends what you do in bed, but. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I think when I get up in the morning and I have food, I, I want to brush my teeth before I leave because that means when I leave the house, my mouth is clean. Um, in the morning, when I'm putzing around the house, getting ready and checking my email, I don't care if I smell or something. I'm not trying to impress anyone. I'm not in any social situations. You know, my wife is doing her thing. I'm showering my kid. So uh, yeah, it just makes sense for me to eat first, which is making your mouth dirty. Then brushing your teeth and and going on with your day. But thinking about like they call the morning breath for a reason. That <laughs> yeah. means like overnight, your mouth closed. You know, it might be germs and things like that. It means you eat your own germs. Uh, interesting. So the reason Thai people do it is because your thinking is that if you don't clean your mouth, it it ruins your breakfast. Is what you're saying? Like it it makes it makes the food taste worse, or it's like it just feel clean. Uh. <laughs> Interesting, but what if you go outside and your breath smells like scrambled eggs or coffee? That's why we have mint. <laughs> well, yeah, this I, I was surprised by this one because I've never, I've never done it any other way. I just make makes sense to me. And then my wife and I have talked about it for years. She's like, "Why do you do this? It's so gross!" And I'm like, "I was surprised to find that she found it gross. I thought it, nothing wrong with it at all." I, I feel like dentists should have a clear answer, and I'm gonna I'm gonna guess. That even Thai dentists think you should brush your teeth after a meal. I'm going to guess that, but I don't know for sure. Maybe we should look it up. If, if there's any Thai dentists out there, we want to know the answer. I, I think it's probably better for your teeth if you brush after you eat. No, it's got to be right. I would assume so. I'm, I'm not a dentist, but yeah, I would. I would yeah, I don't know. This would be like you know showering after you get to work. You know, I want to shower before I go to work, before I go outside. And I want to clean my teeth before I go outside, but I want them to be as clean as possible. I don't want to clean them and then contaminate my mouth with my disgusting breakfast, and then have that on my breath. I don't know, the whole way. I don't know. It's interesting though. I, I never, I never thought, thought it was a problem until I read this, and then I was like, oh, so I'm still going to continue to do it, and my wife and I are still going to continue to argue about it, argue about it, as long as we both brush our teeth before bed and we kiss good night. Then I guess we're on the same page. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thanks, Bully. So, as we mentioned at the beginning of the show, we'd like to say thank you to Mike Graff for lending us his support at the show's shoutout level. Greg, what did you find out about Mike? Well, as it turns out, I didn't find a ton out about Mike, but he did send me a very interesting and very nice letter. Uh, he said that uh, you and I, Ed, you and I together as a Bangkok podcast, we've been very helpful with him navigating Thai culture while he lives overseas and while he's getting used to Thailand uh, on his on various trips, uh, which is great to hear. We always like people to hear how the show has helped them sort of uh, dip their toe into the, the heady waters of Thai culture. And uh, long story short, he said that our conversation about weddings on a show that we did helped him save a lot of money when he realized that dowries, like most things in Thailand, are negotiable. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> yeah, which I thought was interesting. So, um, yeah, I mean, dowries as a concept they are just are just really freaky and weird to most foreigners. And I, yeah. I have always, I've always been against them. I mean, we can debate this, but personally, I, uh, I do not. I'm not a fan of dowries. I, I would agree with that. Yeah, or sin sots. So now, uh, now Mike is in Florida waiting for his wife's visa to come through. Uh, dowry has been paid, and uh, so I think the 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 the, the, uh, the gist of it was that he saved some money on the dowry, which he can probably now spend on a very nice vacation for him and his 
lovely new wife. Oh, he and, lives a in dinner Florida. For, Have, and a dinner for us. Come on. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, dinner for us. Like we said, maybe a lobster or a burger place or maybe some nice high-end beers. We'll let you know, Mike. But uh, we're, we're <laughs> glad that you were able to save some money. And, Ed, have you ever been to Florida? Of course. Many times. Is is Because cause Mike lives in Florida. Is Florida basically kind of like Thailand, like climate-wise, weather-wise? Uh, to be honest, climate-wise, it's fairly similar. I'm not sure if the if the longitudinal lines line up, but... Uh, I think it's pretty similar. It's hot as hell would be a good way to describe Florida. All right. Well, Mike, if the Bangkok podcast doesn't suitably or to 100% fulfill your um, preparations for Bangkok, I suggest just going into the jungle or something like that and just sitting down for a few hours and uh, sweating. And uh, that'll help (laughs) you get used to Thailand. That's right. So That's right. So, yeah, if you're going to do it, do it in Florida. Anyway, thanks for your support, man. We do appreciate it. Congratulations on your marriage, too. And we're glad we could help. Yeah, congratulations. Okay, a uh, final thanks to our patrons who help keep the show ad-free. Patrons get a ton of cool perks and the warm, fuzzy feeling knowing that they're helping support the show. Find out more by clicking support on our website. And connect with us online. We are Bangkok Podcast on social media, bangkokpodcast.com on the web, or simply bangkokpodcast at gmail.com. We love hearing from our listeners and always reply to our messages. Yeah, you can also listen to each episode on YouTube. You can chat with us online or even reach out to me directly on Twitter where I am BKK Greg. So thanks for listening, everyone. And we'll see you back here next week. See you next week. I don't. I have you know, no musical talent whatsoever. Yeah, I mean, neither do I. It's just, you know, like approximately around age like 35, I decided to learn guitar. And so even though I'm like 15 years in, I'm roughly equivalent to a 12-year-old being like six months in. It's basically <laughs> like, it's basically where I'm at. <laughs> like, like, like basically the, the pace at which I learn is it, it's like one like, percent as fast as a twelve year old, like a really smart orangutan. <laughs> Seriously, and it, you know, to be honest, I don't actually think it's my age. I think it's that I've got so much other shit going on that is it's so down the list of priorities that right it, that it's just like I can't make progress, and it's just like so. You know, it's very deceptive when some people ask, "Well, how long have you been playing guitar?" And it's like, technically, I have to say something like 15 years, but that's a wildly deceptive, you know. It's really like three months of work. You know what? It's like learning Thai. Well, how long yes, have you been Thai? No, you're right. I've been, no, here that eight, is exact- I've been here 18 years, but I've been studying Thai for like 13 hours. That's exactly right. <laughs> no.